We've seen how the idea of present bias entered economics through the field of psychology and became part of what we know as behavioral economics. But present bias isn't the only idea from psychology that's helped to shape behavioral economics. And so now we'll just mention a few other behavioral economics ideas, beginning with bounded rationality. Now typically in economics, we assume that people can make the sort of basic calculations necessary to make rational decisions, or at the very least that they have enough of an intuitive grasp about those calculations to make approximately rational decisions. But that doesn't always seem to be the case. In some circumstances, it appears that our brain is wired in ways that make it difficult to grasp the intuition behind even relatively simple calculations. Think about compound interest, for example. Even after decades of being an economist, I'm still amazed at the power of compound interest to cause savings to accumulate over long periods of time. Somehow, our intuition seems to insist that savings will accumulate on a linear path, when in fact compound interest implies that savings is going to accumulate over what looks more like an exponential path. When our bounded rationality keeps us from seeing the underlying intuition of how savings will actually grow over time, we may have a difficult time making rational savings decisions. In circumstances like that, we often resort to what we call rules of thumb. So instead of trying to calculate the optimal savings path for us, we simply implement rules of thumb that financial advisors give us that tell us to put a certain fraction of our paycheck aside every month and in the long run things will work out okay. Or in other cases we might work on how we frame information. So the framing of information can help us break through our bounded rationality. Instead of just knowing about compound interest we could be presented with graphs that actually show us that exponential path instead of the linear path that we expect. Or we could look at different tables that illustrate the scenarios of different savings plans and what they mean because of compound interest over long periods of time. And that idea of framing is also an important idea that relates to perceptual illusions. Perceptual illusions happen when information is framed in a way that creates an illusion about what that information means when it actually means something different. Let me give you an example from two Duke professors, Richard Larrick and Jack Stoll. They went out and asked people which car on the road they would replace if they wanted to reduce the amount of gasoline used. They gave them three options. You could replace an 8 mile per gallon car with a 10 mile per gallon car, or a 25 mile per gallon car with a 40 mile per gallon car, or a 50 mile per gallon car with a 100 mile per gallon car. And when people look at those choices, they naturally gravitate to this third choice. It seems to be the right answer. They then reframed those choices and said, suppose that you could replace a car that uses 125 gallons for every thousand miles with one that uses 100 gallons for every thousand miles. Or you could replace one that uses 40 gallons for every thousand miles with one that uses 25 gallons for every thousand miles. Or you could replace one that uses 20 gallons for every thousand miles with one that uses 10 gallons for every thousand miles. Which one would you choose if you wanted to reduce the amount of gasoline most effectively? Well, now people gravitated to the first choice. Now, it turns out that these choices are exactly the same as these choices. They're just reframed in terms of how information is presented. An 8 mile per gallon car uses 125 gallons uh, per thousand miles. A 10 mile per gallon car uses 100 gallons for every thousand miles and so forth. But in one case people will choose this, in the other case they will choose that. But there is an actual right answer. If you're trying to reduce gasoline used on the road, you would want to replace this car with this car. After all, 25 gallons for every, 30, for every thousand miles would be saved whereas here only 15 gallons would be saved for every thousand miles driven, and here only 10 gallons would be saved for every thousand miles driven. But when the information is presented in this way, we have this perceptual illusion that 
this last replacement will result in a lot of savings in gasoline, whereas the first one will barely make any difference. So reframing how information is presented when there are perceptual illusions can help us make better, more rational decisions. Finally, let me talk about reference-dependent preferences. Typically in economics, we assume that the way we value something is we simply look at it and say, well, how much is that worth to me? What would I be willing to pay for it? But sometimes psychologists tell us that we don't value things in that way. Instead, we value them with reference to what we call a reference point, thus reference-dependent preferences. So let me give you another example from a Duke professor, Dan Ariely, who conducted the following study. Some years ago, there was a Duke-UNC basketball game, and lots of students wanted to go to that game, but they couldn't all get a ticket. So what was done was a lottery was held to determine who would get tickets and who wouldn't get tickets. So there were winners in this lottery, and there were losers in that lottery. The winners got a ticket and the losers didn't. Then they really then went out and called the winners who obtained the ticket through the lottery and asked them how much would they be willing to sell their tickets for. And the average answer was $1,400 per ticket. Then he went to the losers and asked them how much would you be willing to pay to get a ticket now that you didn't get one through the lottery. And the average answer was $170. So the winners said they valued the tickets they had at $1,400, whereas the losers said they valued the tickets they could get but didn't have at $170. Now remember, a random process was used to determine who the winners and losers were. So it's reasonable to assume that the students who won were roughly similar on average to the students who lost. So how could it be that students who are roughly similar value basketball tickets to the UNC Duke game so differently? Standard economic theory doesn't really have a good explanation for that, but reference-dependent theory does. Here, the theory would say that sometimes we value something with the reference point of whether we have it or not that owning something sometimes changes how we value it. That's what we call an endowment effect. An endowment effect says we value things differently once we own them than before we own them. Now that turns out to not be the case in many, many circumstances. But in some circumstances, it appears to be true. The students who obtained the ticket through the lottery, now had the ticket. They were looking forward to the game. They already saw themselves celebrating at the Duke UNC basketball game. And so they, because they used the reference point of that they already had the ticket, valued it very highly. Whereas those students who lost didn't expect to go to the game. They didn't have those expectations. Their reference point was not that they were going to end up going to the game and if they weren't, that would be a loss. Instead, their reference point was that they weren't going to the game, and so they valued the tickets differently. That's an endowment effect. And it's closely related to a second effect, which we call loss aversion. Loss aversion says that when we do have endowment effects, because of reference-dependent preferences, losing something is worse than gaining something benefits us. Well, losing something creates a bigger loss to our well-being than gaining it creates an increase in well-being. So the students who won the tickets felt the loss of a ticket severely. It would cause them to be $1,400 worse off. Whereas the ones who didn't have a ticket didn't feel that gain as much as uh, contributing as much to their well-being as the loss to the winners. So loss aversion says that in cases where we have endowment effects because of reference-dependent preferences, losing something is particularly harmful, more harmful than gaining it is causing an increase in our well-being.
So now before we get together next, I'd like you to think about an application of reference-dependent preferences that may cause us to think differently about the world. Suppose that the way that we evaluate how well we're doing in life is not in an absolute sense, but rather in reference to how our neighbors are doing. So think about me and my neighbor. Suppose we're currently doing equally well in life. So I'm feeling pretty good because I'm doing just as well as my neighbor. But then my neighbor gets a huge raise. Suddenly he's doing a lot better than I am. What does reference-dependent preference theory tell us that will do to me? In the standard economic framework, we would say that if one person becomes better off and the other person stays equally well off, the world's become a better place. Is that still true if reference-dependent preferences determine how we feel about how well we're doing in life and my neighbor gets a raise? Does that change the way we think about whether the world becomes better off? So give that some thought and we'll talk a little bit about that when we get together in class.